Good afternoon. The next item of business today is a debate on motion 9257 in the name of Angela Constance on stage one of the Gender Representation on Public Boards Scotland Bill. And I would encourage members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Angela Constance to speak to and to move the motion in her name. Thank you, President Officer. I'm delighted to open the stage one debate on the Gender Representation on Public Boards Scotland Bill. And I would like to start by thanking all of those who submitted evidence to the Equalities and Human Rights Committee and also to members of the committee for their thoughtful consideration of the bill and their constructive challenge to the Scottish Government uh, to make it stronger. I also welcome that the committee has supported the general principles of the bill uh, and alongside so many stakeholders been so positive about the need for this legislation. I am of course disappointed that the Conservative members do not currently support this piece of equality legislation but I do remain hopeful that they will be persuaded by many of the arguments uh, in favour of it and join the rest of Parliament in providing their support. At its heart, President Officer, this bill is about equality for women who represent 51.5% of the population yet only 45% of regulated uh, ministerial public appointments. It is about this Parliament using the powers that it has to deliver uh, a fairer and more equal Scotland. Women's voices need to be heard and they need to be part of the decisions that are made in Scotland's boardrooms. Scotland's public bodies, colleges and universities are responsible for significant sums of public money and oversee and deliver public services which touch on all aspects of people's lives. And I believe that boards that reflect Scotland's communities will make better decisions for Scotland's communities. And there is ample evidence to support the argument that more diversity leads to better quality conversations, leading to better decisions and ultimately to better performance. Uh, I would, thanks. Elaine Smith. Thanks, President Officer. I thank the Minister for taking the intervention. Would you also agree that whilst this debate and the legislation is about boards, the message it can send can go much wider than that because uh, what the Cabinet Secretary just said is also true for political parties, councils, top uh, management jobs, etc.? Uh, President Officer, I do indeed uh, agree with the sentiment that Ms Smith um, expressed. I'll touch upon some of that, uh, although in terms of the powers that we currently have, uh, we only have the legislative uh, competence and ability to uh, legislate in relation to uh, public sector boards. Uh, but nonetheless, we are grasping uh, that opportunity. And the point that Ms Smith makes that this will send out uh, the strong message and the right message uh, to other parts of uh, Civic Scotland. And I suppose, in essence, presiding officer, I believe that uh, gender diversity uh, is the right thing to do, but I also crucially believe that it's a smart thing to do, and that's bolstered uh, by the evidence I referred to earlier. Two days ago, I addressed the Chamber on violence against women and girls to mark the start of 16 days of activism to end gender-based violence. And I said we also need to tackle the underlying attitudes that can perpetuate men's sexual violence and harassment. And this is an issue uh, everyone across society must tackle. And in order to tackle it meaningfully, uh, we have to become a more equal society. We must acknowledge and redress the inequality of power between men and women. And where we can take action, uh, we must do so. This bill will be part of tackling that inequality in our society by addressing the clear gender imbalance on Scotland's public boards. And this government has made a, a major effort to shift the numbers of women on public boards uh, over the last few years. And I would like to thank all of those who have helped us to change the percentage of women holding regulated ministerial appointments from 35% in 2007 to over 45% today. Yeah, certainly. My a genuine point. I was, will this bill, if it's passed in its current form, will it limit the number of women on the board to 50 per cent? No, the clear answer to that, presiding officer, is no. It is set, setting a, an objective 
uh, that 50% of non-executive members on public boards uh, to be women. It will not uh, limit uh, the appointment uh, of women should uh, people be, uh, uh, bear in mind everybody is appointed on merit. So in theory, uh, a board, uh, if, it, if it so wished, could have more than 50% uh, women. Uh, in terms of the, the, the progress that we have made, uh, presiding officer, we have made uh, significant progress uh, over a, a relatively short period. Uh, and I, I do believe we should all be proud of that. Uh, women are better represented on Scotland's public boards now uh, than they have ever been. But in my view, that makes it even more important that we have legislation which underpins all of the work which has gotten us to this point. And there is a quote by the writer Zadie Smith that I've, I, I, I use a lot because it's one of my favourites. And Zadie Smith says, progress is never permanent, will always be threatened, must be redoubled, restated and reimagined uh, if it is to survive. And we only have to look as far as this chamber to understand what Zadie Smith was getting at. There are fewer women in the Scottish Parliament today than there were in 1999. And despite uh, the efforts of Westminster to really champion women on private sector boards, uh, starting with the Davies Review in 2010, the percentage of women on private sector boards remains low at 27.7% for FTSE 100 uh, boards and 22.8% on FTSE 250 boards as of October this year uh, and in accordance with the Hampton Alexander Review. And I still remember an article from The Guardian a few years ago. It said at the time uh, that there were more men called John on the boards of FTSE 100 companies than there were women. In fact, actually, there were more, more men called David uh, and more men with knighthoods uh, than there were women. So we cannot be complacent. And I, for one, do not want to see that in five years, 10 years, 20 years down the line that we have stalled or even worse, uh, regressed. And when we think about progress, we can't just think about getting over the line. We have to think about how we sustain, embed it and uh, build upon it. Now, the bill sets a, a gender representation objective for public boards that 50% of the non-executive uh, members are women, where there are two or more equally qualified candidates, at least uh, one of whom is a woman. The bill requires that a woman be appointed if this will result in the board achieving or making progress towards achieving the gender representation objective, unless appointing another candidate is justified on the basis of a characteristic or situation particular to that candidate. And this could mean another protected characteristic uh, under the Equality Act, uh, someone's socioeconomic background or being a carer uh, or a parent, for example. And the bill also requires steps to be taken to encourage women to apply to become non-executive members of public boards. And this is really, really important. We can't focus only on the final decision. We need to get women into the process in the first place. And the evidence suggests that when women get into the process, it, they perform very well. Certainly. Jamie Green. Uh, I do thank the Cabinet Secretary. I just want to make a clarification on it a technical point on the bill itself. In its current form, does it state, therefore, that in a tie-break situation where there's a male and a female candidate, the first preference is given to the female candidate unless there's another protected characteristic which the board feels it, can, it should take into account, in which case it could offer that position to the male candidate? I'm, I, I just want to clarify the technicalities of it. I think it's important, presiding officer, that we don't get into setting uh, one characteristic off against another uh, as such, perhaps in the way that uh, Mr Green um, articulated uh, there. There, are, there is guidance from the Equality and Human Rights Commission, for example, on uh, what is meant by equally qualified uh, and how to respond to that situation. But if I can be clear that uh, the bill requires uh, that a woman be appointed um, in a tie-break situation, which, to be honest, isn't going to happen very often where you get two candidates that are exactly equal uh, in every way, but that where that happens, if the board is underrepresented by women, that a woman could be appointed in the situation, unless appointing another candidate is justified on the basis of a characteristic you know, another protected characteristic, whether that's someone's ethnicity, 
uh, a disability uh, or um, their socioeconomic background or that they are uh, a, a, a carer. So, you know, a lot of this will be um, laid out um, as clearly as possible uh, in our guidance and uh, in the point about, about statutory guidance. But I do think the situation um, is clear about what will happen in a, a minority, uh, you know, a situation that will, of course, be ve very rare. Uh, yes. Lane Smith. Thank you, President Austin. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking the further intervention. And I wonder if she'd agree with me that we should also um, bear in mind that women are also diverse and would have uh, various characteris uh, protected characteristics too. Um, indeed, um, uh, uh, women are 51.5% of the population uh, and there are, are therefore not um, homogenous. And of course, we can come back to um, other issues in, in closing remarks uh, if further clarity is required around the, the tie-break situation. In terms of the time that I've, I've got left, uh, presiding officer, uh, the committee has made uh, a number of very constructive suggestions to strengthen the bill. Uh, as I set out in my response to the committee's stage one report, should the general principles of the bill be agreed this afternoon, uh, the Scottish Government will bring forward uh, amendments at stage two in response to the committee's recommendations. We will publish new statutory guidance uh, to support the implementation of the bill uh, in consultation with public authorities and other relevant parties, uh, including the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life in Scotland. And we will ensure that guidance provides clarity uh, in the areas highlighted uh, by the committee. On the recommendation of both the Equalities and Human Rights Committee and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, we will bring forward an amendment at stage two with the effect that regulations under section eight of the bill will be subject to the affirmative procedure. I also absolutely agree with the committee's position that the requirement to report uh, is central to the bill's effectiveness. Section seven of the bill makes provision for Scottish ministers to bring forward regulations requiring the publication of reports on the operation of the Act and we will work with the committee ahead of stage two uh, to bring forward an appropriate amendment. I was very interested in the committee's suggestion of introducing an aggregate gender representation objective for chair positions. Now I absolutely understand the committee's argument for doing so, the percentage of women in chair positions lags significantly uh, behind that of non-executive members generally. And I appreciate the reasoning behind it, uh, but for the reasons that the committee itself acknowledges, creating an aggregate chair objective across all of the public boards to which the bill extends would not, in my view, be workable in practice. But I can commit to ensuring that this is an area that we'll keep a very close eye on. The Scottish Government uh, public appointments team is already taking action. We've established a future chairs mentoring project which pairs experienced chairs with serving board members. The project uh, targets uh, groups who are currently underrepresented at chair le level, uh, including but not only uh, women. And we are also looking at the overall package of support for current board members, ensuring that we support them to grow their skills and confidence. And just this uh, autumn, we appointed two new female chairs to Scottish Fire and Rescue Services and to the Scottish Police Authority. And I agree wholeheartedly with the committee's position on the inclusion of trans women in the bill. And I would like to reassure the committee and members that the Scottish Government is actively looking at how we ensure the bill is as inclusive as it can be. And I will, of course, provide the committee an update as soon as I am able to do so. Sign off, so the committee has raised the question of how the bill will impact on groups of people who share other protected characteristics as raised by Mr Green. And it is an important one. In order for boards to truly reflect Scotland's communities, we need to take action to improve the representation of ethnic minorities, disabled people and younger people too. And although this bill relates to women, I believe that it can be a catalyst which drives us forward towards greater diversity uh, beyond gender in terms of groups of people who share other protected characteristics and diversity in the widest sense. And it does so because it puts a spotlight on current processes challenging everyone involved in public appointments, ministers included, to ask themselves whether existing approaches are truly maximising our ability to attract the most diverse, talented people to Scotland's public boards. How we word person specifications and where we advertise appointments uh, are, uh, for example, very important. They're practical considerations, but we know that they make uh, a big difference. 
So in conclusion, presiding officer, um, I want this bill to be as strong and as successful uh, as it can be. And with that ambition, I look forward to hearing the views uh, of members this afternoon and uh, I very much hope and urge members to support the general principles uh, of this bill and I move uh, the motion in my name. Thank you very much. I call Alex Cole Hamilton to open on behalf of the committee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's a privilege to open this debate today on behalf of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee on our Stage 1 report on the Gender Representation on Public Boards Scotland Bill. I should start by offering the apologies of our convener, Christina McKelvey, who can't be here for personal reasons. Before proceeding, I would also like to thank all of those who provided evidence to the committee to assist in our deliberations. As always, the opportunity to discuss issues with experts was vital. Uh, to our understanding and we hope to have reflected these opinions fairly and accurately in our report. I'd also like to pay tribute to my fellow committee members for their close scrutiny of the measures contained within the bill. Although it is regrettable that we were not all able to agree the general principles of the bill, all committee members did contribute thoughtfully to our consideration of the issues which I'm sure will be given a full airing today. Can I also put on record our thanks to the Cabinet Secretary who expressed her will to work with the committee as the bill progressed through Parliament and whose response to our Stage 1 report was positive and considered. I welcome this approach and I'm sure that members from across the Chamber will take the opportunity to offer constructive improvements to the bill not already com committed to by the Government at Stage 2. I think that Bill Thompson, the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life, summarised this legislation best when he described it as trying to ensure that there is no black backsliding on what we do, nor lose the gains that we have made. That, in a nutshell, is why a majority of our committee support this bill. Although the percentage of non-executive board members who are women has risen from 35% in 2013 to 45.8% in September 17, this has been the result of dedicated, targeted and prioritised work on the part of Scottish Government and related bodies. We believe that enshrining a target in law alongside appropriate monitoring and reporting mechanisms is the change that is necessary to ensure that public boards always reflect the population they serve without being either prescriptive or falling foul of positive discrimination. At this point, presiding officer, I would like to tackle some of the myths which have surrounded this bill. This bill does not establish quotas. The bill does not ask public bodies to appoint on any other basis than merit. Yeah, yeah. Positive action is not the same as positive discrimination. Yeah, yeah. And positive action will ensure that we are able to aggressively tackle the problem of underrepresentation of women on our public boards. And the evidence speaks for itself. Uh, positive action works. Positive action does not preclude appointing on merit, and diverse, diverse boards beget better outcomes. In addition to the 21 written submissions we received, the committee held four separate evidence sessions with six different panels. We heard from equality groups representing uh, different protected characteristics, some of the public bodies who will be covered by this legislation, trade unions and legal experts, as well as the cabinet secretary for uh, herself. And the overwhelming message was that now is the time and this is the path to take to lock in the gains that we have made. Having said that, presiding officer, there are some areas where we feel improvements could be made. And the bill sets out what it describes as a gender representation objective, which is that by the 31st of December 2022, 50% of non-executive members of public boards will be women. It aims that, to achieve this objective by using positive action measures. It is crucial that we distinguish positive action, which involves offering targeted assistance to disadvantaged uh, groups or underrepresented groups, from positive discrimination, whereby an individual is chosen solely on the basis of their protected characteristic. This bill does not introduce positive discrimination, which is, of course, illegal. When considering the objective, some witnesses asked whether the 50% target, as my colleague just did, is an exact target or a minimum percentage to reach. Colleagues will notice a theme throughout my speech today. As I say, we believe this could be a source of confusion, which we expected could be clarified in, gu in guidance. It's therefore very welcome that the Scottish Government has confirmed in its response to our report that 50% is, as the Cabinet Secretary just confirmed, not an exact target or cap, and does not preclude a public board from having more than 
who are women. It is also welcome that the government has confirmed that this would mean in a tiebreaker uh, provision would not apply when a board had already met the 50% target and that all of this will be clearly uh, reflected in guidance. Although we are already close to meeting the gender representation objective as currently drafted, colleagues may be shocked but not surprised to learn that only 25% of board chairs are women. Board chairs are important in setting the culture, strategy, tone and direction of their organisation and there is little point in rearranging the deck chairs if the captain of the ship is steering towards an iceberg. Since session five started, we have already seen examples of how the boardroom can be a cold house for women members, and it is vital we take action to address this too. Our suggestion is to put in place an aggregate target for board chairs, which matches the ambition for board members. Although we appreciate that the government's view uh, may, may be difficult to practically apply, we do hope that the Scottish government will take on board our suggestion in the spirit that it is intended and find some mechanism to take it forward together at stage two. Presiding officer, I mentioned earlier the tiebreaker provision in the bill. Now, some witnesses argued that there, were there a need to apply the tiebreaker uh, included in section four in the recruitment process, a white woman may be appointed over a disabled man or a man from the BME community in order to meet the target, thereby resulting in the board perhaps being less diverse than it would have been. Although section 4.4 does include an exception for a tiebreaker to go in favour of a candidate who is not a woman on the basis of a characteristic or situation particular to them, some witnesses felt that this wording was unclear. We welcome the manner in which the Scottish Government has clarified Section 4 in their response to our report and their commitment to provide a clear explanation in supporting guidance. This is, I'm sure, helpful reassurance both to the committee and to the wider public sector landscape. Now, one of the few areas of potential disagreement is on how protected characteristics other than gender could be legislated for. The bill seems something of a missed opportunity to cover all protected characteristics in some way. And perhaps the Scottish Government will reflect on whether those who are disabled from an ethnic minority community or who are young may require similar legislation in the future to lock in board diversity, if not through amendment to this bill at stage two. In addition to these wider concerns, presiding officer, groups representing one particular protected characteristic have raised specific issues with the definitions within the bill. My colleague, Mary Fee, was very diligent in questioning every set of witnesses on whether the language used to define women in the bill was inclusive of trans women. And the common message was that it could be improved. The Scottish Trans Alliance made a compelling argument for change and even helpfully suggested the language uh, how the language could be changed so that the objective could cover those living in the female gender with trans men and non-binary trans people included in the proportion outside the objective. This small but sensible change would help to ensure that we avoided the tragic irony of a bill designed to improve diversity using non-inclusive language. In both oral evidence and the response to the committee, the Cabinet Secretary committed to looking at the language used within, within the bill to ensure it was inclusive of trans individuals. And we look forward to seeing these changes being pro proposed by the government at stage two. Presiding officer, throughout our scrutiny of this bill, my colleagues and I asked witnesses how we could ensure that the bill would be enforced through monitoring and reporting. It became very clear very early on to us that financial sanctions would be counterproductive, given that any financial penalty would only take money away from public bodies or the services they provide. And many witnesses made the valid point that a public naming and shaming of recalcitrant bodies would in many cases be just as powerful and that, uh, and that the carrot is often better than the stick. Given that somewhere but within the region of 60% of appointments are made by uh, ministers, the case for financially punishing non-compliant boards becomes even less coherent. However, as most of the appointments made by Scottish boards are in the final analysis made by uh, Scottish ministers, the committee were strongly of the view that Parliament should have a role in monitoring the progress through which such reports are made. We therefore recommend that the government, uh, we've therefore recommended to the government that they should, uh, there should be a reporting duty within the bill. And I was pleased to see that the cabinet secretary has confirmed that an amendment will be support, uh, brought forward at stage two to this effect. I will. 
Gail Ross. Thank you. Um, does Alec Cole Hamilton agree with me that the reporting process could also help to support boards um, that are not reaching their goal of 50 50? Alex Cole Hamilton. I thank Gail Ross for the intervention. I absolutely agree with that. I think there's also a process by which we can uh, disseminate best practice through that reporting so that people can see the steps that uh, appointing persons and the boards that they represent are taking to encourage women to come forward for board membership. So we hope that, that uh, this coming amendment will reflect the role of Parliament in holding government to account and that we parliamentarians will have the opportunity to press the government should progress be found to be wanting. Schedule 1 of the bill lists all of the public authorities which fall under the auspices of the legislation. And, presiding officer, you will be aware that the public sector landscape in Scotland is, of course, complex. And it was therefore welcome that the Scottish Government was able to provide us with definitions of different types of bodies included in the bill and detail on why certain bodies are covered or not covered. Only two potential areas of contention arose during the bill, and that was in relation to the integration of joint boards and higher education institutions. In evidence, University of Scotland argued against the inclusion of HEIs on the basis that they were not-for-profit bodies and are autonomous, not-for-profit uh, charitable institutions, rather. However, the Cabinet Secretary pointed out that universities are considered to be public authorities under equality legislation, and not including them in this bill, which only covers non-executive members, would be inconsistent. Indeed, UCU uh, Scotland also made the point that universities receive £1.5 billion of Scottish Government money. And given that the argument was made on the principle of inclusion rather than the merits of the bill itself, we absolutely agree with the Scottish Government that HEIs should be included in the tenants of the bill and in Schedule 1. The bill, as drafted, would see any new bodies added to the schedule by regulation subject to the uh, negative procedure, but we are pleased that the Scottish Government has accepted the view of ourselves and the DPLR committee that this should be, in fact, by the affirmative procedure. Now, I think we all recognise the importance of closing loopholes in legislation, which may be used to avoid obligations, and we therefore consider it important for the Scottish Government to specifically define the appointing person for each authority so that we can leave no wiggle room uh, if there was a lack of progress being made. The government's argument is that such an approach would require amendments every time a body seeks to change their governance or makeup, which is a reasonable point to make, but we hope that such detail can be provided in guidance, which is not subject to the same legislative process. And it is on the subject of guidance, presiding officer, which there was a consistent thread throughout our consideration. And in our view, it's vital for the success of the bill. I've already mentioned the Scottish Government has agreed to clarify the 50% target, the use of the tiebreaker situation, and the appointing person for each authority through such guidance. Our major concerns were twofold. One, that the guidance should be statutory, and two, that this guidance should flow from pre-existing guidance uh, on offer for public appointments, ensuring that there is minimal confusion over the process for public bodies and appointing persons alike. We are sure that the government's promised consultation on, the, uh, on this guidance will highlight the need to provide examples of best practice within the guidance. It should also, for example, set out steps boards could take uh, to ensure their working practice do not deter potential candidates or lead to new members having to leave that board at an early juncture. We're delighted that the government has agreed that guidance should be statutory and that appropriate amendments will be made to that effect at stage two. In closing, presiding officer, I would like to reiterate uh, the Equalities and Human Rights Committee's majority support for the general principles of the bill at stage one. We look forward to continuing our scrutiny of this bill at the next stage of the parliamentary process and consider the aforementioned amendments uh, from the government and indeed from any other members of this parliament. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I now call on Annie Wells to be followed by Monica Lennon. Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer. For me, the Gender Representation on Public Boards Bill, although altruistic in its aims, essentially boils down to one issue, and that is, do I believe gender quotas to be the real marker of progress for women? From the early days of being an MSP, I have spoken very openly in, in the Chamber, on panel debates and on the television about my views on gender quotas, and I have been consistent in my approach. Yes, I want to see equality for women, of course I do. I want to see 50-50 representation of women and men in all spheres, whether this be in politics, the FTSE 350 companies, or as we speak about today as non-executive 
board members. However, I don't wish to see the use of statutory quotas as the means of doing so, and that is why I can't support the government's motion today. I recognise that support for this bill, which seeks to make it a legisl legislative objective that 50% of non-executive public board members are women by the end of 2022, is unanimous amongst other parties. Yes. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful to Annie Wells for taking an intervention. I, I listened to her first minute of the speech, which suggests this bill is all about quotas, which in fact it's not. Indeed, it's about merit. And on the 28th of September, Annie Wells said during an evidence session on this bill, merit sits at the heart of this bill, as far as I can see. Now, I agree with Annie Wells on this. Why doesn't she? Annie Wells. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, I, I, I did say that, absolutely, and I do believe merit is, is key to, to everything as well. And I have said that on many occasions in debates and on panel discussions. And I have been told, uh, and I, I have been put down for, for using the word merit. I do, I did say that merit was at the heart of the bill, but if you let me carry on, you'll see why I can't support the bill at stage one. So despite gender developments and gender equality across the UK, women remain underrepresented on boards and more widely across the decision-making bodies of our society. With women constituting more than half of the population, they represent just 32% of in the House of Commons and 35 in here. In the FTSE 100 companies, women make up just 7% of chairs, and in the FTSE 300 companies, 16% of corporate executive committees. Of course, we want to see vast improvement being made because these vigours are truly uncomfortable to read and mark just how far we still need to go to achieve equality for women. And whilst I wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly believe more needs to be done, my point today is this, however, do we believe that quotas will truly address the, the cultural and societal barriers preventing women applying for board positions in the first place? Will they identify and seek to rectify the obstacles preventing women reaching top board positions, or will they serve as a misleading marker of progress? The bill is already limited in scope. The bill relates to certain public sector bodies, colleges and higher edu education institutions in Scotland. It does not extend to private companies or charities. And whilst at the time of the bill's introduction, the percentage of non-executive female board members stood at 42%, this figure is now 45.8%. And further to this, Scottish ministers are already responsible for around 60% of appointments to boards coming within the scope of this bill. And as a member of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, I have been present at many of the evidence sessions that have taken place to discuss the issues and practicalities of this bill. The bill is loaded with ambiguities. And although I recognise this is stage one and the debate seeks only for broad agreement on the general principles, it's important to acknowledge the issues now. The main principle of the bill is that it aims to achieve 50-50 by using positive action measures. Where two candidates are man and woman who are equally qualified, it is stated that the preference must be given to the woman. Understanding how this will work in practice, however, is difficult. How will those responsible for appointing board members interpret what exactly is meant by equal measure? And how will guidance ever be clear enough as not to allow for loopholes? Without clear guidance, the Law Society of Scotland points out the bill ru runs the risk of encouraging positive discrimination as to meet targets something that would run contrary to EU legislation. Further to this, there is an issue around non-compliance, something that has been raised consistently since the bill's conception. Compliance will not be mandatory. Whilst authorities will have to report on the operation of the Act, there will be no sanctions or penalties. And as the committee pointed out in its report, and I quote, a bill without, an appro without the appropriate teeth risks the appearance of legislation for legislation's sake something that I wish to, to reiterate. And throughout the, the committee stage of this bill, questions have rightly been raised over the bill's sole focus on gender as a result. It has come un, it's become unclear as to what exactly the bill seeks to achieve. Whilst, of course, I wish to see public boards more reflective of our population, this aspect of the bill has brought with it more questions, adding another layer of confusion. How will the exception whereby positions can be given to someone who is not a woman where it can be justified on the basis of a characteristic or a situation, particularly to other candidates, be worked in practice? How will this significant addition, not present in the Bill's conception, work within the framework of a gender-focused Bill? 
And to return to my earlier point about underlying barriers to women in the workplace, I want to repeat my concern that this bill may distract us from the bigger task at hand. Women face similar barriers to getting on public boards as they do in employment generally. Yeah. Gail Ross. Thank Annie Wells for taking that intervention. Um, on the contrary, does um, Annie Wells not agree that encouraging women to go on boards, uh, public boards, would have a knock-on effect to the other situations that she um, suggests on, in private businesses as role models for powerful women on boards? Annie Wells. Absolutely, we should encourage women. I don't think targets encourage women, but we should encourage women in all walks of life to, to, to step forward. But I don't think targets is the way to go with that. But these are often cited as lack of flexible working, lack of affordable and quality childcare and occupational segregation. As College of Scotland points out, there's a whole raft of barriers to women not being recruited as non-executive board members, most significantly, a limited pool of interested candidates. We should be pushing the wider moral and legal imperatives to achieve equality between men and women, showing why there is a clear business case for increasing diversity and encouraging women to seek these positions. Statistics show us that there is 50, a 53% higher return on equity for companies with a higher percentage of female board members, and it is widely accepted that diversity is good for the workforce in general. I've seen firsthand the work such as companies of FDM in Glasgow is doing to get more women into its ranks, both at graduate and executive level, recognising the value women bring to business. As a FTSE 250 company specialising in IT, gender equality is a huge part of its ethos. 50% of its management team is female. It has a medium gender pay gap of 0%. And this year it launched its Getting Back to Business programme aimed at bridging the gap between women taking a career break and re-entering the workforce at the level at which they left. FDM are one, one of the first companies to provide a report on its gender pay gap in response to a UK government initiative which requires companies with more than 250 employees to report on their gender pay gaps. And by publishing these figures, this initiative aims to shine a light on sectors not doing so. And this is not the only root and branch initiative the UK government has pushed ahead with. As indicated earlier, while we are still a long way from equal representation of women, I would like to highlight initiatives that have shown to have had an impact without the use of quotas. Between 2011 and, and 2015, the number of women on the FTSE 100 boards more than doubled to 26% in less than five years. In 2016, as part of the Hampton Alexander Review, UK government set a voluntary target last year for the FTSE 350 companies to increase female board representation to 33% by 2020. Of course, I acknowledge that we still have a long way to go, but these are the kinds of initiatives we need to be promoting. Yes, we need positive action, but that shouldn't be fixated on quotas for women. Instead, it should be in bold measures surrounding childcare, educational reform, and inspiring young women through role models as we can here in the parliament. I will remain a champion of progress for women, but I will never see the way forward on this with the introduction of statutory quotas in everyday public life. And this is why I can't support the motion today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call on Monica Lennon to be followed by Tom Arthur. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to be opening to today's Stage 1 debate on behalf of the Scottish Labour Party and to set out our support for the principles underpinning this important piece of legislation. I'm pleased that the Scottish Government has brought forward the Gender Representation on Public Boards Scotland Bill. And I'd like to begin today by paying tribute to the many amazing campaigners who are champions for improving women's representation and rights and who have led the charge behind getting this bill to the stage we are at today. Women 50-50 and gender, close the gap, the Scottish Women's Convention and many more. The fight to increase women's representation in public life and to convince others of why it is required is a long, hard and sometimes lonely journey. So we all owe a debt of gratitude to the committed and tenacious women and men who have been arguing the case for positive action for many years and in some cases decades. The passage, of, the passage of this bill, we believe, will be a positive step in confirming Scotland's commitment to gender equality. 
Scotland's public boards make so many decisions which affect the running of our services and all of our daily lives. So it is only right that women should receive fair representation in the places where those decisions are being made. A statutory target for women to make up 50% of non-executive board membership by 2020, in our view, is necessary to ensure that the progress that has been made so far doesn't slip backwards. At the most basic level, those in positions of power in Scotland should reflect the society that we seek to represent. It is a simple issue of fairness and equality. If women are over 50% of the population, and we are, we should also make up at least 50% of the decision makers. But we know that's not the case. And it's not only in public boards that women are underrepresented. Early this year, in Gender, Sex and Power report revealed that women are largely posted missing from almost every area in Scottish public life, making up only 35% of members of the Scottish Parliament here in this place, 29% of local councillors, 16% of council leaders and 28% of public body chief executives. Or put another way, that means men account for 65% of parliamentarians, 71% of councillors, 84% of council leaders and 72% of public body chief executives. Looking at these figures, it's baffling to me how anyone would still continue to conclude that we live in a system of meritocracy. The over-representation of men and under-representation of women is rooted in structural inequality that still sees women being valued less than their male counterparts. It is the same structural inequality which allows a culture of sexual harassment and violence against women to flourish. Only earlier this week, colleagues in the Chamber have been debating the Scottish Government's equally safe action plan and the need to end violence against women. Violence against women is the most extreme end of a continuum of behaviours which is underpinned by sexism and structural inequality. Smashing that structural inequality requires us to make changes and increasing women's representation and voices in public life is part of that solution. The bill we are debating today will start to go some way in addressing this. We know that women and men often experience life differently because of cultural gender roles. Women make up the majority of unpaid carers, lone parents, low-paid workers and survivors of abuse and sexual violence. Women are also disproportionately affected by austerity. Policies and services which affect women's lives from education, healthcare, justice, housing and more must also be informed and shaped by women themselves. However, I know that some, especially the Conservative MSPs in the Chamber, question the need to legislate for gender equality at all and prefer to rely on voluntary measures. But voluntary measures are not enough to address the gender imbalance in public life because of the structural inequality which does exist throughout society. It is positive that the number of non-executive women members on public boards has increased to 45% on regulated boards. However, when we only rely on voluntary measures, there is always a danger that this progress can slip backwards. And therefore, we believe that this legislation is essential to make sure that doesn't happen. And that's why we support the principles. Certainly. Alex Paul Hamilton. I'm very grateful to Monica Lennon for intervening on, for letting me intervene on what is an excellent speech. But um, does she agree with me that in their opposition to this bill, that the Conservative Party seemed to be fundamentally misunderstanding the difference between quotas, as they describe it, which this bill is not about, and targets, what, which is what this bill is actually about? Monica Lennon. I thank Alex Cole Hamilton for his intervention and for his, his work on the committee. Um, I think Annie Wells, in her opening um, remarks, has, has um, created some confusion. I mean, I, I know it's clear that the Conservatives don't support this, um, but at the end, I think Annie Wells did say that she supports positive action. Um, but I think there, there is a bit of confusion. But if Annie wants to intervene, I'll gladly take it. Annie, Annie Wells. Wells. <laughs> Thanks. I, I thank Monica for taking an intervention. Can I just ask the, the, the point, yes, positive action, we all want positive action. I, I, I stood here and says I do, but do you not think that underneath this bill, that encouraging women should be the thing that we look at? We don't need legislation to encourage women to step up and step forward. 
and we do not agree that there's other fundamental issues like childcare, childcare quality, childcare as well. Uh, Monica Lennon, I can allow you a little extra time, Ms Lennon. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I mean, if Annie Wells and her benches support positive action, then they should be supporting this bill. And it's not one or the other. I think we can encourage women and we can promote policies and government decisions, whether it's at a UK level or a Scottish level, that don't harm women's life chances. But we need more women around the table. And I don't see the Conservatives proposing anything that's going to speed that up. So they've got time to change their minds. So I'll make a little progress. Yes, yeah, so the argument against positive action um, is misguided, in my opinion. The Tories, on the one hand, say it's unfair that we are creating an artificial advantage in what should otherwise be a free system of competition. But I believe that this ignores the obvious. The current system already offers an unfair advantage to men. And the purpose of positive action is to start to redress that balance. Positive action and quotas enhance equality. They don't hinder it. And there's research and academic studies to show that far from damaging the so-called meritocracy, positive action actually promotes women who are qualified and therefore promote the principle of merit. It doesn't undermine it. There are more than enough qualified women with a wealth of experience and knowledge throughout the country who are capable and qualified to fulfil these roles. The legislative duty to consider gender representation is about giving these women an equal chance to access them. I also acknowledge from the, from the committee's report that there are some valid concerns um, that were raised with the committee, particularly from Inclusion Scotland. They raised the, the need to promote the representation of other protected characteristics, and we've touched on that so far today. For example, people in the trans community, ethnic minorities and disabled people. Um, Scottish Labour agree that robust and diligent guidance must be forthcoming to accompany the bill to ensure that due consideration is given to the inclusion of other underrepresented groups and the case of increasing women's representation in Scotland is done through an intersectional lens. Increasing women's representation is about improving the representation of all women, including disabled women, women of colour and working class women too. Presiding officer, um, I think my, my, you gave me a little bit more time, but I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up by saying, in conclusion, we're proud to be supporting this bill at stage one today. Um, again, we thank the Qualities and Human Rights Committee for their work. We believe the bill is a landmark event in how Scotland approaches the case of women's representation. It's a positive step in the right direction towards achieving a society where we have true equality of representation across all of public life. Thank you. <laughs> We move on to the open debate and its speeches of six minutes have been allowed. I do have a little bit of time in hand, so I can allow some leeway for interventions. We have Tom Arthur to be followed by Alison Harris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am grateful for the opportunity to contribute to this stage one debate on the Gender Representation on Public Boards Scotland Bill. I have to say I was somewhat disappointed to read in the Equalities and Human Rights Committee's report that the committee's two Conservative members, Jamie Green and Annie Wells, do not support the general principles of this bill. No, and being from a party whose Scottish branch office has more MPs named David when it does female MPs, it is perhaps hardly surprising. I only raise this point because I had hoped that this debate would be a moment when Parliament, if I'd like to make some progress, I had hoped this would, uh, debate would be a moment when Parliament would speak as one. But alas, we must once again make the case for the principle of gender balance in public and civic life and the case for action to achieve that. This being the situation, I will focus my remarks on the broader context of why this bill is needed and why it should progress. Presiding officer, it is a fitting time to be discussing balanced gender representation in civic life. Next year will mark the 90th anniversary of the representation of the People Equal Franchise Act which gave the vote to all women over the age of 21. This brought parity uh, with the terms enjoyed by men since the representation of the People Act 1918, which had only enfranchised women over the age of 30 who met a property qualification. Prior to that point, women had been explicitly prohibited from voting in statute. In the period between these two acts of the interwar period, Scotland and the UK saw an increasing number of women enter politics and public life, including the first female MP and renowned figures at municipal level, such as Mary Barber, who, 
incidentally was born in Kilbarkin in my constituency of Renfrewshire South. Despite these early advances, progress has since at times been painfully slow. For example, between 1918 and 2015, a total of 400 women were elected to the House of Commons, while in the, tw while in the 2015 UK general election alone, 459 men were elected. Women account for barely one in four members of the House of Lords. In the century since the first women were enfranchised, all but two out of 19 different UK Prime Ministers have been male. Out of 35 foreign secretaries, only one woman has been Britain's top diplomat. And of, 40, and of 40 home secretaries, women account for three. Three also being the same number of male home secretaries in that period named Sir John. No woman has ever been head of the UK Home Civil Service, and there has only ever been one female speaker of the House of Commons. Presiding officer, I highlight all of this because until May of last year, the power to enact the provisions of this bill rested at Westminster. Had the people of Scotland not elected SNP governments committed to bringing powers to this parliament, there would have been no Scotland Act 2016, and we would now not have the opportunity to propose these measures which, if enacted, will ensure that our public bodies better reflect those they serve. <coughs> the Tories' failure to support, to support these measures is sadly now not surprising. After years of rebuffing calls for greater devolution and demanding that the Scottish Government use its existing powers, the Conservatives now want us to sit on our hands. Just as with powers over taxation, the Tory position is to do as London says. And let me say this, presiding officer, it is no wonder opinion polls now show them trailing in third place. Whether it's the racist and bigots they deem fit to be councillors or the mindless marionettes of your front bench in this place, it's clear that the people of Scotland are seeing through the Tory charade. Presiding officer, the moral case for equal gender representation on public boards is unimpeachable. That in itself is enough justification for this bill. However, there is also a powerful business case. Research commissioned by the Scottish Government on greater diversity for pri private boards highlighted benefits, and I quote, including lower labour turnover, higher levels of commitment and motivation amongst employees, improved reputation, better understanding of customer needs, and more flexibility and creativity within the business from the increased range of perspectives, skills, and capabilities. Presiding officer, this research speaks to the broader international evidence regarding the negative impact on imbalance of gender power has on a range of equalities outcome. This is something referred to by Engender in their Equal Voice, Equal Power publication of last year, which states that having women around the table changes the substance and outcomes of discussions. Increased numbers of women in leadership positions enriches perspectives and increases prospects for public gender, for public gender sensitive services. Representative public boards also contribute to the challenging gender stereotypes and perceptions around public uh, authority and send an important message to young women and men within their respective fields. Presiding officer, that point regarding changing the substance and outcomes of discussions is so incredibly important because the substance and outcomes can all be improved by gender balance representation. Perhaps that explains why the gender balance cabinet of the Scottish Government functions with such efficacy and, com and competency compared to Theresa May's cabinet of chaos, where women make up barely a quarter with just six out of 23 members and which is dominated by the grasping, fevered male egos of Johnson, Fox and Gove. Presiding officer, in concluding, I wish to reiterate my support for the general principles of this bill and I commend the Scottish Government for bringing it to this chamber. I also wish to recognise the work of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee and the important points raised in this report. As with all bills at stage one, this is a work in progress and I trust that the Scottish Government will continue to engage as thoroughly with stakeholders at stage two as they have done to date. Presiding officer, I encourage colleagues from across the chamber, including Conservatives, because it's not too late to repent on this, to back this bill this evening, and I look forward to its progression. I call Alison Harris to be followed by Mary Fee. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Gender Representation on Public Boards Bill has at its core an aspiration that I'm sure everyone in this chamber shares 
to ensure that people, regardless of gender, have an equal chance to take senior roles in these important public bodies. A review for the UK Government pointed out that when boards have a strong female representation, they perform better than those without, and that gender diverse boards make better decisions where a range of voices drawing in different life experiences can be heard. The Institute for Employment Studies also points out that diversity assists greater innovation and creativity and helps organisations compete in an increasingly globalised and diverse marketplace. And yes, I very much agree with Engender when they highlight that having women around the table changes the substance and outcomes of discussions and sends an important message to young women. As others have said, the aim of the 50-50 split in many areas of public life is positive and one to be welcomed. Public bodies need to reflect the makeup of modern Scotland, whether it is in councillors providing vital local services, parliamentarians, both here and at Westminster, to those who serve on public boards. The disagreement that we have with these proposals is on the means of actually getting there. Oops, sorry. As a political party, the Scottish Conservatives fully recognise the need to encourage more women into public life. In 2016, we adopted in Scotland Women to Win, an initiative set up to boost female representation throughout the party by identifying suitable potential candidates and giving them support and mentoring. It is early days, and as Ruth Davidson recently acknowledged, we still have far to go. However, I believe that it is vitally important that every female Conservative candidate knows that they have got there on their own merit and not to meet the needs of a quota. I'm going to come back if you let me. Well, OK, what, on you go. Monica Lennon. I'm grateful to Alison Harris for uh, giving way. There, there are a number of women in this parliament who, through their political parties, um, did become candidates on the back of positive action. Um, does Alison Harris agree that they got their own merit? Alison Harris. What I would say to you is true merit, you know, you can call it whatever you like, positive action, quota or anything like that. Dressing up the word, when you drill it down and boil it down, it ultimately comes to a quota. I believe merit should be on merit alone. Okay, so... Right, so already and without quotas, progress has been made towards gender equality and I applaud the fact that women currently make up almost 45% of public board membership. Women who have got there, these positions because they were the best applicant for the role. Women who rightly consider themselves every bit as good as men and through the selection process have proven that fact. No, I'm going to continue, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, that willingness to prove our worth comes from an early age. I recently gave a talk at one of the local high schools in Falkirk and I asked the girls present if they felt that they needed to help the help of quotas to get on in life. Not one of those students did. Every young woman there was more than confident that they could compete on equal terms without the need for any special treatment and more importantly, they expressed their desire to be chosen on merit. No, I'm going to continue, thank you. No tiebreaker clauses, no wrangles over the interpretation of equally qualified or best qualified, and certainly no toothless legislation for legislation's sake, as even the report itself warns against it. A bill, yes, with aspiration, but so vague in many respects as to how to meet its aspiration, other than by through a deeply flawed idea of quotas. In some ways, the proposal appears to be from the, the school, we have new powers, we must use them, School of Government. Without this legislation, progress towards equality has been gathering pace. As I mentioned earlier, almost 45.8% of members of public boards are already women, and the Partnership for Change has already seen over 200 organisations moving towards the 50-50 target, with a number having already achieved that. We have seen progress as public bodies actively seek ways to ensure that suitably qualified women both know about and are encouraged to apply for board positions. In 2015, more women than men were appointed to public bodies and the ratio of women appointed against those making applications has steadily increased. In 2016, 43% of applications for public boards were for women, a figure higher than the target set out in the Diversity Deliver strategy. It's good, but it's not good enough. 
No one on these benches is complacent or is denying that more work still needs to be done on equalising gender opportunity. I spoke recently in the Chamber about the need for more young women to be encouraged into well-paid roles in engineering and technology, helping to address the gender imbalance in these traditionally male-dominated areas. Many glass ceilings have been broken in recent times. We've had two pri women Prime Ministers, both Conservative. A woman First Minister, numerous party leaders and many leading women have proven that they can succeed in what was once considered male-dominated roles. We have much to be hopeful of and fears that this progress may stall and even be reversed with a display of lack of confidence in the fact that women have now proven themselves capable of meeting the challenge, whether it's in politics, business, our armed forces or in the boards of public boards. However, the principles that appointments are made on the basis of merit, integrity, diversity and equality are ones that must continue to be upheld. And I believe that favouring one candidate over another on the basis of gender-defined quotas threatens how this will be perceived. No matter how altruistic it is in its aim with this bill, the fact is, at the core, I'm in my last sentence, sorry, the fact that, I'm sorry, I'll start again. No matter how altruistic in its aims this bill is, the fact that at its core is the assumption that women cannot succeed without quotas, and you can call it what you like, whether it's positive action methods, as I said to Monica Lennon, when you drill that word down, it's quotas by the back door. It means that I am unable to support this bill in its progress. Thank you. And I call Mary Fee to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I am grateful to the Presiding Officer for their cooperation in allowing me to conclude a meeting before attending the Chamber for this debate today. Presiding officer, as a member of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, I am grateful to have the opportunity to contribute to this debate this afternoon. And can I start by thanking my fellow committee members and the committee clerks who were of great assistance in arranging evidence sessions and producing the very informative Stage 1 report. And I'd also like to thank all of the witnesses who gave evidence to our committee and their constructive comments, criticisms and reflections on the gender representation on Public Board Scotland Bill is a vitally important part of the legislative process, which ensures that the legislation can be improved and strengthened. And, Presiding Officer, I wish to initially touch on two important points with regards to the Bill. Firstly, I'd like to touch on the general principles of the Bill and the rationale behind the legislation. And secondly, I'd like to pick up on the lack of a definition of women in the current form of the bill. As has been outlined by my colleagues, Scottish Labour fully support the general principles of the, general, the gender representation on public boards Scotland bill. However, it's clear that going forward, the bill will need to be amended in response to the evidence given by witnesses to the Equalities and Human Rights Committee and for the recommendations which are outlined in the committee's report. Men continue to dominate positions of power in Scottish society. Men are in the majority in our boardrooms, in our parliament, and in our public boards across Scotland. And the bill quite rightly seeks to address this imbalance. Women make up over 51% of our population in Scotland, and it's therefore only right and just that women take up at least 50% of the seats on our public boards. And we must encourage, we must empower and employ more women in senior positions where they have the ability to act as senior decision making makers. And furthermore, I believe it's critical that in our effort to promote more women into positions of power and influence, that this effort is inclusive of all women and that's why I believe it's vitally important that the bill provides a definition of a woman. In their evidence to the committee, the Scottish Trans Alliance proposed that the bill should contain a de definition of woman to include a person with the protected characteristic of gender reassignment who is living in the female gender. And this is a suggestion that I am entirely supportive of and I am glad that the Scottish Government have stated their willingness to consider an amendment on this issue at stage two. 
And there has been a clear consensus in this afternoon's debate, if we discount the contributions from the benches across from me, over the general principle of the bill to promote gender parity on Scottish public boards as part of a wider framework to promote greater gender equality in Scotland. There's also been an emerging consensus throughout this debate over the need to amend the bill, reflecting the evidence given to the Equalities and Human Rights Committee to ensure the legislation is both comprehensive and effective. And there are two important areas that will need further consideration. And these are sanctions against non-compliant boards and the use of the tiebreaker. And concerns were raised in committee about the practical application of the tiebreaker clause and the need to ensure no ranking of protected characteristics occurs. And we cannot allow unintended consequences to damage the very positive aspects of this legislation. And guidance relating to the use of the tiebreaker and training and support for individuals using the process may be required. And no doubt the strength of this bill will be in its practical application and the successes that it will achieve. And the, the committee grappled with the, the carrot and stick approach and which approach is the most useful and which will bring the most benefit. A requirement for public boards to lay a report before Parliament may well be sufficient stick, especially if part of that report would require boards to explain or to rationalise the reasoning behind appointments where the tiebreaker <coughs> is used and a woman is not appointed. And it's clear that the bill is well intentioned in its effort to redress the gender imbalance of representation and power on public boards in Scotland. And there are clearly some issues which the Scottish Government need to give extra consideration to, to propose amendments and to work to strengthen the bill. And it's vitally important that this bill acts as a comprehensive, effective and robust lever to promote gender parity on public boards in Scotland. And it is a bill that I and my colleagues are happy to support. Thank you. I call Patrick Harvey to be followed by Gail Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm uh, very pleased to have the opportunity to contribute to this debate and to put on record the support of the Scottish Green Party for the general principles of this bill. And I would like to thank the committee for the work that they've done on their stage one scrutiny and all those who've given evidence uh, to that process. There are no doubt some specific details of the bill where we can all agree that there might be room for improvement. And I'm pleased that the Scottish Government have indicated some willingness uh, to look at some of those. Uh, there's be discussion around the, the definitions, for example, on uh, where exemptions to the, the general approach of the bill might be taken and how best to balance different equality strands, different protected characteristics. There'll be uh, a case for discussing how this bill goes beyond the, the, the simple letters on the page and gives leadership to wider Scottish society, as uh, I, think, uh, I think it was Elaine Smith in an intervention first made that point, that this should be about giving leadership, not just in terms of public boards, but across wider society to achieve the same uh, objectives. Uh, and there's also obviously going to be ongoing discussion about specifically which bodies are uh, listed in, in Schedule 1. Uh, I happen to agree with the, the subordinate legislation committee uh, that uh, negative instruments for any future changes to Schedule 1 uh, are a bad idea and a positive uh, instrument would be better. I tend to think negative instruments are always a bad idea and it, it might be that if I ever have the, the privilege of serving in government, I'll suddenly be convinced that negative instruments are great and we should use them all the time. Uh, but I, uh, from the point of view of an opposition member, uh, I'll certainly argue in favour of affirmative procedure and proper scrutiny if changes are needed. In particular, it did strike me that the Scottish Parliament itself uh, is not listed as a public authority in Schedule 1, and I understand there are some complex legal arguments as to why that's not the case. However, we've been aware over recent months in particular in this Parliament uh, that the way that appointments internally within the Parliament take place do not adequately reflect 
the principle of gender balance to which the vast majority of us uh, are committed. Uh, and if future changes are needed, whether in relation to this bill uh, or in relation to other ways in which internal appointments uh, within this parliament can be uh, improved in the, the application of gender balance principles, uh, I think we might take the opportunity of this bill as a way of debating how we advance that argument, even if it doesn't specifically require amendments to the legislation itself. But as a, as a member of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee, uh, I think we all bear a responsibility to make sure that the way internal appointments within this parliament uh, are carried out uh, is done in line with the, uh, the duties that we're now applying to public boards uh, and public authorities. Uh, finally, in terms of, of potential tweaks and changes, I, I agree with the, the comments that Mary Fee just made uh, and others have referred to as well, uh, that we can improve the way that trans uh, people are uh, recognized within this system. I think in many ways that may be simpler and more straightforward than the uh, perhaps more challenging question about how people with a non-binary gender identity uh, are represented within, this, uh, within this, this general policy approach. Now that's, that's something that my own party has uh, wrestled with and discussed and not yet resolved as well. Uh, I think Monica Lennon mentioned political parties in, in this respect and I have to stand here and recognize that I have the privilege of speaking about this bill representing a party uh, that knows that good intentions alone don't result in gender balance. Uh, we have demonstrated the good intentions of achieving gender balance candidate selection, making sure that we have gender balance at the, the tops of our regional lists, not just throughout our regional lists, uh, and uh, ensuring that our women's network contributes actively uh, to the life of the party and to the development of its policies, its, its practices, and its culture. But elections don't always work out the way we like. And I think that experience uh, is going to be similar to the experience of public boards and public authorities uh, that are affected by the duties in this bill, good intentions alone don't always work out the way you hope. Good intentions alone are not enough to achieve uh, gender balance. And sometimes we need to look at our mechanisms and ask ourselves how they can be improved. That's something my own party is committed to. And it's something that I think our society needs to do as well. And passing this bill is one way uh, of achieving that. We can all do better, my own party as well as our society. The question of the general principles, though, I, I really do have to respond in the last moments or two uh, of, of my speech in the, the questions about challenges to the general principle. The, the idea that this bill isn't needed. We've actually been asked to consider the prospect uh, that Theresa May is an example of how women can succeed on merit. I think there may be more compelling and convincing examples out there than Theresa May. The idea that uh, uh, Annie Wells tells us, uh, uh, I want to see 50-50, but I don't like targets and quotas. Well, 50-50 is a target. 50, yes, indeed. Jamie Green. I'm sorry to say, I find Mr. Harvey's comments around Theresa May quite distasteful in a sense that you may not agree with her politics, but you should not put her down as a woman politician. Yes. Patrick don't, Harvey. I don't seek to put her down as a woman politician, I seek to put her down as a politician. Full stop. Thank you. Um, the, the idea that, uh, that, if, if, uh, that targets and quotas must be rejected, um, you know, if, if targets and quotas were, as we've been told, the wrong way to achieve equality, then I think the critics of this bill would have a long list of evidence of where targets and quotas have failed to achieve that objective. They have no such evidence because targets and quotas work. They are successful, not just examples in this country, but around the world. And I think we should be, be clear uh, that we want to continue to ensure uh, that these approaches are successful. The idea that we should oppose this bill because it doesn't cover everything would be to say that because we cannot solve every problem with a bill, we should do nothing. And the idea that appointments on merit only, uh, is, uh, regardless of equality characteristics, is something we should be committed to. The idea that appointments in terms of civic uh, authority and power in our society are distributed on a merit 
is as bizarre as the idea that economic power uh, in our society is distributed uh, in terms of hard work or that educational opportunities are distributed in terms of academic ability. They are not. They are distributed in terms of privilege. And I need to acknowledge that I am part of that uh, as a, uh, an able-bodied white middle class, and though I might like to deny it, increasingly middle-aged man in our society, I have the ability to stand here for more than my allotted time and speak because of that privilege. And so I should sit down and stop doing it, presiding officer. Gail Ross, you can have seven minutes. Ooh, <laughs> Followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you, presiding officer. First of all, before I go any further, I would like to declare that I am here as a product of an all-female selection process. And I look forward to anybody telling me that I'm not here on merit. I would also like to reiterate the Deputy Convener's thanks to our witnesses. The hard work, dedicated effort and length of time that goes into each public appointment can't be underestimated. I pay tribute to all of those who ensure that the process of selecting those who work hard to provide vital public services goes smoothly and that the right choices are made. And that's what this bill is all about. How we support people who have a contribution to make to public life. This bill does nothing to change the fact that appointments will be made on merit and that the best person for the job will be selected. If anything, this bill helps to lock in the merit-based approach by supporting the process of widening the net for new talent to join our public boards and increasing competition for places. In his opening speech for the committee, the Deputy Convener mentioned Integrated Joint Boards, or IGBs. As members will be more than aware, President Officer, the governance arrangements of IGBs are complex. IGBs are not included in the bill, but we heard from Glasgow City IGB, who would like to be included in Schedule 1. I think the government would agree with the committee in principle that IGBs, which receive significant amounts of public money, should be included, but we do recognise that this may not be possible. However, we hope that the debate about this bill will encourage local authorities and health boards to consider the gender balance when appointing their members. Presiding officer, I would also like to touch on the financial implications of the measures contained within the bill which the Scottish Government ranged from between 30,000 and 250,000. Our colleagues on the Finance and Constitution Committee issued a call for evidence on the financial memorandum, and although this only received four responses, the response from changing the chemistry was helpful for our understanding of this issue. They argue that the estimated costs are not accurate, as they do not take into account the cost of time for staff or the support provided by organisations. However, we were assured by the Cabinet Secretary at her evidence session that these costs have been taken into account, along with other potential extra childcare costs as well. And we were told that the progress already made by many boards and the pre-existing work being undertaken in this area is reflected in what the Cabinet Secretary, Cabinet Secretary described as an ample and generous financial memorandum. In our opinion, we are content that this is indeed the case, but we welcome the government's assurance that they will monitor these costs. President Officer, I would like to give the committee and anyone who is watching a few quotations from some people that gave evidence to the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. Some members questioned, and indeed, as we have heard today, still are questioning the need for the bill. But we must remember that soft measures have only made advances in some sectors. Yes, we are currently at over 45% as a whole of women on public boards. This is an encouraging figure, but it's still not 50%. And some boards have no women on them at all. And that's what we need to bear in mind. They are not representative of public life as a whole. Suzanne Conlin from the Scottish Women's Convention said, one of the reasons we think the bill is important is that women tell us it is. Lindsay Millen from Close the Gap said, we want to ensure that women can access the roles on public boards because we will then be able to create a new generation of role models for young people, in particular, young women who see that these jobs are for them. Talat Yaqub from Women 5050 said, 
soft and gentle approaches involving training and development have been done for decades and they have not got us to 50%. Rory McPherson from the Law Society of Scotland said, after 10 years of voluntary schemes, we are yet to achieve gender diversity on public boards and against that background, the Law Society supports the bill. Liz Scott from Highlands and Islands Enterprise said, it's an important way of raising awareness, not just in public bodies, but across Scottish society about the place that women in this case can take on public boards. Stephanie Miller from the Equality Challenge Unit said, while recognising the huge progress that has already been made, we believe that legislation would show a clear direction and not only provide national leadership, but enable local leadership. Mary Senior from University and College Union said, we believe that the legislation is necessary. The Scottish Government is working on increasing diversity on public boards through both its disability and race strategies. The Public Boards and Corporate Diversity Programme continues to drive forward improvements in diversity by developing outreach activity with disabled people and minority, minority and ethnic communities. In conclusion, President Officer, I would like to thank the Government for its constructive approach to the scrutiny of our bill both the clarification letter we received ahead of our stage one scrutiny and the government's response after publication of our stage one report have been very helpful. Not only for our understanding of the bill, but also I'm sure that of the wider public sector and the public as a whole. And it's vital that the government continues to speak openly and plainly about the measures and the intent of the bill to dispel any misconceptions of what this bill is trying to achieve. A committee's role in the legislative process is to scrutinise the merits of a bill, suggest improvements and prevent bad law from being placed on the statute books. The majority of our committee believes this bill will secure the progress made in recent years for future years. It's a positive step towards better diversity of thought and experience on our public boards because we know that better diversity brings better decision making. And that is why we support its passage at stage one today. Thank you. I still have a wee bit of time in hand, so speeches of up to seven minutes. Please, Alexander Stewart, followed by Elaine Smith. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As many colleagues have indicated earlier in this debate, no one can fault the primary goal of the proposed piece of legislation uh, that we're discussing today. We all want to see public boards that better reflect the society in which we live and ensuring that more women are appointed to them is very important. I am not a member of the committee, but I'd like to pay tribute to the committee for the work they've done. And I'd also like to pay tribute to all those who give evidence uh, during this process. While equal representation on public board is obviously desirable, it is worth noting that the gender balance is far more representative than there are in other public institutions. Women currently make up 45.8% of the membership of public boards, but only account for 34.9% of members of this parliament, for example. This raises the question of whether quotas are the right way to tackle the root cause of gender inequality. There is still significant barriers to women looking to enter the workplace, as such a lack of affordable childcare, flexible working, and this bill does not address these issues. It goes some way, but we still require to support women in ensuring that they have the opportunity to go and become part of the institutions that we wish them to become. And if they do not have that affordable childcare or they do not have that flexible working, it becomes a barrier to them getting into that position. We, of course, want to see society move towards equal representation. Thank you. Yes. And I'm grateful to Mr Stewart. Um, I, I hear what Mr Stewart is saying on the one hand, that he is very supportive of boards actually uh, reflecting the composition of our society. He will, of course, be aware of the endeavours uh, as a government that we are doing, despite not having employment powers, doing to support flexible working. And I'm sure he's very well aware of our work to expand uh, early years and childcare. But I wonder if he could point to something that he believes would help to reach 
better balanced boards, but is an action that would work that we're currently not doing. Alexander Stewart. The Cabinet Secretary makes a very valid point. I think that we all have to engage. Uh, and yes, you've gone some way as a government here to try and to tackle some of these problems, but there are other opportunities out there that we all need to try and tackle. Now, you're talking about the boards in specific, uh, and, and I acknowledge the fact, uh, but I still maintain that there are other opportunities that we can do and that we should do. Uh, and, and I think that they're best placed uh, to ensure that we engage, to ensure that, that that flexibility and that working practice is taking place. We still have a long way to go, uh, Cabinet Secretary, to ensure that takes place. And I know that the government have, have great uh, aspirations of going forward, but they don't always come up with the goods at the end of the day. We, of course, want to see society move forward uh, equally represented. Uh, and as I say, we, we have to ensure that we go some way, and we have already gone some way, but there are other groups that require to be supported as well. We do not, however, believe that the positive discrimination of statutory quotas is the right way to achieve this, and we therefore cannot support the bill as it stands. Even if for a moment we take the case uh, that quotas are, are an appropriate method of achieving the objective of gender balance in the workplace on one side, there is a number of problems in the way in which the bill has been drafted that means that we are likely to see it possibly becoming unworkable going forward. We have heard the main method of positive action within the bill and we talk about the tiebreaker case which states that if there is two equally qualified candidates, preference must be given to the woman. This raises a number of questions, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, excuse me, Mr Stewart. Um, the front bench has been left empty um, by a government member. Can we make sure that the seat's filled again, please? Please continue, Mr Stewart. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. While the bill has clearly been drafted to avoid being in conflict with EU legislation, the wording is quite vague and woolly in places, whereas if there are two candidates equally qualified, it is likely that it's open to interpretation by those, by those who are appointing these individuals on the board without a set of specific guidelines as suggested by the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, the bill could run the risk of being in breach and we don't want legislation to fall into that category. In addition, the bill grows consistently the scope into originally muted. And I think that, you know, as we look at the qualifications going forward, women must be given priority uh, uh, as, as a candidate. We acknowledge that fact. We understand that. But I think my colleagues, Annie Wells and Alison Harris, have made some very valid points in their speeches today about the quotas, about the culture uh, that we must uh, rectify and try and look at as we move forward on stage one. Uh, this well-intentioned group, uh, the Act underlines the bill of rejecting the avoidance of gender equality in public boards. And moreover, Deputy Presiding Officer, the Law Society of Scotland has rightly highlighted concerns that the voluntary nature of the bill means that it is unlikely uh, to be effective uh, uh, going forward. While we acknowledge there have been some successes in similar schemes in some EU countries, they argue that voluntary quotas are likely to be ineffective uh, as the process. However, we must understand and we must look at the bill uh, uh, and talk about legislation. We don't want legislation that is confused. We don't want legislation that can be challenged. Uh, and as I say, the Law Society has talked about the opportunities that may cause. So in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, there is unanimity across this chamber in about how we support the bill and understand that, that trying to achieve this. But we in the Scottish Conservatives believe that the situation the statutory quotas is the wrong way to go about achieving its aims and we will therefore not be able to support the motion today. Thank you. I call Nalene Smith to be followed by James Dornan. Uh, up to seven minutes, please, Ms Smith. Thank you, President Officer. And can I also start by thanking the Equalities and Human Rights Committee on their scrutiny of this bill proposal. The report seems to me to take a reasoned approach to scrutiny of the bill which is designed to tackle an institutional problem of discrimination against women in our public life so it really is a pity that it wasn't unanimously supported. President officer we should keep reminding ourselves that women make up more than 50 percent of the population and that statistic should be reflected on our public boards in our parliaments councils and senior appointments in the public sector. It's hardly unreasonable to expect equal representation as a minimum 
for women and all of the decision-making bodies of our society. And that, in turn, should send a message to the private sector and society at large, a point I raised with the Cabinet Secretary earlier and was also made by Patrick Harvey in his contribution. This is a massively important issue because unless we have fair women's representation in public life and on our boards, then we will continue to see policies and practices that discriminate against more than 50% of the population. And that, in turn, then, helps to underpin a society where inequality, sexual harassment and violence against women are still prevalent and commonplace, a point also made by Monica Lennon in her opening. And, of course, there was a debate about violence against women and girls earlier in the week. That's something that the Scottish Government, I know, are tackling. President Officer, I want to pick up on a point that Alison Harris uh, made earlier. I grew up in the 1960s and 70s, and I had strong women role models, and particularly my mother. And I didn't particularly consider myself discriminated against as a woman, either at school or as a student or at teacher training college. But my eyes were opened in my early 20s when I started working in a council housing department in the 80s. And it was then that I noticed that all the main promoted posts in the authority were filled by men and all the clerical posts by women. I was a union rep and I job shared the Equal Opportunities Officer post. So I decided that I would do a bit of work on that. And computers were just coming into workplaces and I was helped by the computer manager to run a graph, sounds funny that it, it was a new thing then, but to run a graph showing the way in which women were overrepresented in clerical and lower admin grades. And that then changed around the middle of the admin grade so that by the time it reached principal officer, there was one woman and the chief officials were all men, as, of course, were most of the councillors. So whilst there has been some movement in the intervening 30 years, it's just simply not enough. And actually, in some areas, as has been pointed out across the chamber, we've, we've regressed like this parliament itself. We can't just keep waiting on women's equal representation and equality in the workplace to just happen by itself, because it's not going to. And the same is true of public boards. Of course, I'll take an intervention. Rachel Hamilton. I thank Elaine Smith for taking the intervention. I wondered if she would agree with me that recent events um, have taught us that quotas don't go far enough to address the issues that women face for example, in this parliament, such as sexism and sexual harassment. Elaine Smith. I thank the member very much for that intervention. And, and I did make that point earlier, that we do need women's representation to make sure that we tackle all of these issues in society, because women's experiences and contributions are absolutely necessary to make sure that we do tackle those issues and also that we have equitable delivery in our public services. That's an absolutely vital issue as well. And we're not going to get rid of um, gender discrimination in areas like health, education and housing if we don't have women in positions of power and influence. And in particular, I would say on public boards, because that is something that we can very directly influence. And their recent, uh, published, recently published Gender Matters Roadmap and Gender point out that significant vertical occupational segregation exists in public sector professions that are staffed predominantly by women but are managed by men. So, for example, men comprise 81% of NHS board chairs, but 71% of the total NHS workforce is comprised of women. And gender go on to make the point that this, and I quote, highlights the need for targeted action to tackle barriers to women's leadership in public life, along with broader strategies to address occupational segregation and the gender pay gap. Turning specifically, presiding officer, to the committee report, whilst the committee support the bill at stage one, it is qualified support and they intend to look at improvements at stage two. One issue the committee considered was whether focusing on one protected characteristic of the Equality Act 2010 ahead of others would help or hinder in making public boards more diverse. And I have sympathy with this issue. I would like to see boards much more diverse and representative of all protected characteristics and indeed also of social class. However, as we address the serious issue of underrepresentation of women in public life, we should also remember that women themselves are diverse, and that is a point that I made earlier on an intervention with the Cabinet Secretary. And I personally come under the definition of additional uh, protected characteristics, including disability. So, presiding officer, positive steps should be taken to ensure that women are recruited from a wide range of backgrounds and with different and multiple protected characteristics as defined by the Equality Act. 
However, overall, it is about time that women's representation, or in fact under-representation, was seriously addressed. And I believe that this piece of legislation does help with that. It should take a common sense approach to fixing this injustice and it should focus on doing exactly that. President officer, concerns um, have been raised both in the committee report and by the Law Society that the bill as introduced might not have appropriate teeth and that was something that Alexander Stewart also mentioned in his contribution. And in particular, the Law Society point out that the lack of progress achieved in the UK on the basis of voluntary schemes leaves them sceptical about the effective impact of the bill in its current form. And then Gender 2 said that, and again a quote, robust enforcement is essential and without a meaningful recourse for non-compliance, there is a significant possibility that gender balancing measures will not be taken seriously by those charged with implementing them. So that is, of course, something that needs further consideration if the bill is supported tonight at stage one and as it progresses. President officer, there's also, uh, as mentioned by Annie Wells, a recruitment and retention issue with regard to women on boards. So the issues underpinning that and the barriers to women participating must be tackled. And that looks like looking at issues like timings of meetings, childcare support and training for applicants and also assessing the screening and shortlisting processes to make sure that they are fit for purpose. Can I just finish with this, uh, presiding officer? Women make up more than 50% of the population. It's a travesty that public boards don't reflect that in membership. So I support this bill at stage one and I look forward to following its progress. Thank you. We're well, back to six minutes, please. Uh, James Dornan, followed by Rachel Hamilton. Uh, discrimination against the men, presiding officer. I'm just not happy with that at all. Uh, can I uh, thank you, presiding officer, and uh, just say that recent events have highlighted the barriers that women still have to face in many cases to achieve the positions that their male counterparts do. If we accept, as we surely do, that young women achieve better at school and that women constitute over 50% of the population, then how can it be acceptable for them not to be fairly represented in public boards, politics, or in any other sphere? Unless, of course, when they reach a certain age, their brain goes all too mush because of their love of Justin Bieber or whoever is the fad of the day. Now, that's just nonsense, isn't it? There wouldn't be one of us in here who doesn't owe a huge debt of gratitude to intelligent, smart and strong women. I know I do. When I was a kid, my grand, my dad's mum, was the matriarch of the family. She was all of those things I described above and much, much more. As well as running a big family and extended family, she also had time to be involved with local campaigns and local politics. This bit embarrasses me. She was the secretary of the local Labour branch. I know, I know. Uh, but I realised, despite that, that later that I had learnt a lot from her. I got my love of politics, though, my fire and my detestation of people being mistreated from my mum. She was the one who filled me full of indignation, taught me what was right, and my politics all come from her. Except for independence, to be fair, which I eventually persuaded her the merits of. But the point of this is that if my gran had been my granda, if my mum had been my dad, I do not believe for a second I'd have been the first elected politician in my family. That's how it's always been for women. And although there's no doubt that things have changed, recent events highlight just how diligent we must be to ensure that everyone sees not a woman or a girl only fit for certain roles in life, but a person as capable as any other based on their abilities and skill set. Yet how many women here can honestly say they yet feel it's a level playing field? that they don't feel the game is still unbalanced in favour of the male. That is why I, as a male, am so happy to be speaking in this debate and adding my voice to all the others looking to ensure that soon we will have equality, not just on the boards, but across the board. Evidence clearly shows that everyone benefits from having more gender e equality in boards. Uh, and gender have been quoted a few times today, but wh what they did say was increasing numbers of women in leadership position enriches perspectives and increases prospects for public gender sensitive services. And re representative public boards also contribute to challenging gender stereotypes and perceptions around public authority. And to finish the quote that was said earlier on by somebody, and sends an important message to young women and men within their respective fields. And I think that's very important, that this is not just about examples for women to follow it's for it's examples for men to see that women have to be taken seriously when some of them with some of the the, the cultures today don't appear to take women as seriously as possible as they definitely should do now as convener of education i was delighted to see that the committee are uh, including in the bill universities and colleges because education is an opportunity which is open to all but there are specific needs 
of students and young people which is dependent on their gender. And as we endeavour to encourage all our young people to be the best that they can be and to encourage them to study who are studying at home or in other parts of the country, we're increasingly aware that young people have to be supported, not just in their educational issues, but in personal issues as they grow into rounded adults and become an integral part of our society. That is why having gender equal boards would help change a culture, which I've heard too many upsetting reports about where women are targeted in some of these educational establishments, but the culture of the establishment doesn't recognise the dangers and stress that these women have had to go through. Just of course, I'm all. Rachel Hamilton. Um, does the member agree with me that the um, objective to improve um, opportunities and experiences for all learners and with a focus on gender imbalance, on course uptake, as outlined in Scotland's youth employment strategy, is a good way forward? The, of course, James Dornan. There's lots of good way forward, uh, and this is, but this is one of them. The, the reason why I'm surprised and disappointed that, the, that you won't support the principle at stage one is, is the fact that this is another good way forward. I mean, one of the, the, the regular messages that's been coming across in, in the Conservative contributions has been, we know there's something that has to be done, but let's just do a wee bit more of what we've been doing and hope that it gets better. We can't wait that long to get that message out. We, we have to do something more radical and not conservative, and I mean small c conservative in this case. We have to, we have to take something like this bill, and it may well be that they, there's amendments to strengthen it or whatever during the course of the process, but we have to do something like this bill, and we have to vote it through at stage one so that the pr general principles are, uh, are uh, agreed. Uh, Presiding officer, I was talked earlier on about how women still have a bit to go and it's not just in education and it's not just in boards. I mean, and it's been mentioned before, take this place with Nicola Sturgeon as our first minister, two deputy presiding officers, including your own superbly intelligent and magnificent self. Uh, and after the last election, the leader of the three main parties were all women. I have to try and get one of the presiding officers on my side. Uh, and I'm blessed with a cohort of extremely talented female, many of them young, colleagues who will go on to great things and yet if I'm being honest it's not enough. Women have to put up with a level of scorn and disapproval that we don't. They have to worry about how they look in a way that we don't and they have to worry about not being taken as seriously as they should be in a way that we don't. It's time we accepted that this was a problem created by men, men who generally don't want to give up power or privilege and it's about time we took responsibility for our actions. Recognise that sometimes we are going to have to miss out when we think we're the better candidate because in the long run, a fairer and more representative parliament and boards can only benefit the people. And after all, isn't that why we're all meant to be here in the first place? Thank you. The last of the open debate speakers is Rachel Hamilton. Uh, six minutes, please, Ms Hamilton. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to point out to my colleagues in the chamber here today that I was elected on June the 8th fairly and squarely and on merit. All four candidates were female, there was no all-female selection process and there was no zipping involved. To address today's stage one debate, my colleague Annie Wells made a great speech highlighting the key reasons why this bill is not a solution to solve the gender imbalance on public boards or indeed in the workplace. And for the reasons Ms. Wells hi hi highlights, we cannot support this bill. But it is not to say that we are against equal gender representation. Far from it. It's an ambition that we share. The difference is our approach to the objective. The Scottish Government seeks to install quotas from above and force equal gender representation through. Statutory quotas are a blunt instrument and do not address the underlying issues which result in women being underrepresented in the workforce. I, I will give way. Mike Rumbles. I've got the bill in front of me. I'm not a member of the committee, uh, and I've just read the bill, but I can't find anywhere where it talks about quotas. Could you point it out to me? Rachel Hamilton. It, I've got the uh, bill in front of me, and I thank the member for that intervention, and I think there has been some dispute about targets and quotas today. If, but if we're going to create a bill to legislate for gender balance, surely a quota, as we are discussing, of 50%... 50-50% is exactly the same as what you're talking about. Why do we need legislation to actually do this? Why do we need legislation? Instead, I believe that a top-down approach, we should approach this issue from the bottom up. That is to focus on the root causes females face growing up in nursery, in school and at university. 
These are areas in which we can focus to address and target stereotypes and the deep structural issues within our society. In these environments, ambitions and ideals are formed, perceptions of what one can and can't do. The problem is systemic. It's ingrained in everyday living, and this needs to be challenged. Developing the Young Workforce, Scotland's Youth Employment Strategy, set about to address this. A main objective was to improve opportunities and experiences for all learners, with a focus on reducing gender imbalance, on course take-up. That's an ambition I am supportive of. The success of voluntary measures have shown that they are working, such as Partnership for Change 5050. Therefore, the purpose of this bill is already being addressed. With the strategy set to conclude in 2021, it seems rather odd that the Scottish Government would wish to push through legislation before seeing whether it is actually required. A rather large reservation with this government approach is the lack of sc scrutiny associated to it. There are countless examples of, of legislation forced through with no post-legislative <laughs> scrutiny. The same is true for strategies. Is it working? Is it not? Has it worked? Has it not? Nobody seems to know because the SNP would rather not say. As with all pieces of SNP legislation passed, it remains an unknown whether, it, if passed, the outcome of legislation will be explored. Worse yet, this legislation may cover up the problems at the root of gender imbalance. Damaging stereotypes will be overlooked because the equal outcome of gender representation, mandatory by law, will no longer identify a problem in any given workforce. Could I make some progress just now? Thus, efforts to challenge the misconceptions and perceived limita limitations that are ingrained into young girls and young boys at a young age may go unchallenged. Further problems lie in the impact of this bill to other groups. Colleges Scotland is right to say, it is important that a focus on gender does not become discriminatory against other protective groups or characteristics, or that the best candidate is disregarded in order to meet a legislative requirement. And colleges have also raised concerns about the potential risk of candidates being unfairly discriminated, which is in conflict to the Equality Act 2010. The tiebreaker clause is therefore cause for concern, for if presented with two candidates with the same experience and qualifications, the female must be chosen. This seems to be worded in a way that suggests positive discrimination. Colleges also highlight a problem that many may have, which is public bodies can only appoint from candidates who have shown an interest in applying. And I was wondering if the Cabinet Secretary would like to confirm that if there is no female candidate, then the candidate cannot be chosen. But this final point is an important one because it leads to us to ask a question. Why was there no female candidate? Was it because the culture that perpetuated an outdated stereotype of what can and cannot be achieved went unchallenged? Was it because at some point limitations were put in place? I'll give way. I'm in my last minute, but I'll give way. James Jarnan. Thank you very much. Do you not think but that, that having 50-50 boards, even public boards, would send out a message that the behaviour of, you were saying, some of the other areas, that, that that's not acceptable? It wouldn't be covering up issues. It would actually be shining a light on issues and saying that if they can have 50-50 in public boards or in Parliament or whatever, they can also have them in private and, and the rest of society. I, I thank James Dornan for that Hamilton. intervention and I do believe that voluntary measures have made progress and are continuing to make progress. It's the culture that underlies gender imbalance that we really need to get to the bottom of and legislation will not do that, it will mask gender imbalance. Mm -hmm. I would suggest it may well be the case and why legislation is not only unnecessary but misdirects where our attention should be placed. That attention should be on challenging the culture, challenging stereotypes, challenging false limitations. In short, the root causes of why a gender imbalance exists and that, for that reason, I cannot support this bill. Thank you. We now move to the closing speeches and I call Monica Lennon. Six minutes, please, Ms Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, well, it's a privilege to be speaking again for the second time in today's debate and to close on behalf of the Scottish Labour Party. Um, I think it's been an interesting debate. It's been quite lively, but it's also been quite frustrating at points. But I think everyone's made their contribution with passion. And um, I think, um, you know, we can take a lot from the discussion. 
Um, there is general consensus, uh, both on the committee and in the chamber, that the bill is the right thing to do and it is necessary. Um, as expected, obviously the Conservative Party don't support the bill, but I think there's been some mixed messages today about the reasons for that. Um, a consistent thread throughout today's debate has been the issue of the so-called tiebreaker and concern around this. The worry appears to be that giving consideration to gender representation will somehow have a detrimental impact on other protected characteristics. The most common example that's been given is that a white middle class woman will be or could be given preference over a man with a disability, for example, or from a, an ethnic minority, and therefore not contribute to increasing the overall diversity of boards. I have to say that I agree with the Cabinet Secretary that we must be careful not to get into the territory where we're setting off one protected characteristic against another. And women are also a diverse group. I think that point's been made well by several members. Um, Elaine Smith said that, that women are different and, and can have multiple protected characteristics. But it is clear to me from the contributions today that there is widespread agreement on these benches and the government benches that the intention of this bill is for it to be inclusive and intersectional. And I welcome the contribution from the Cabinet Secretary that the government will work with the committee ahead of stage two to introduce strategy guidance to support the implementation of the legislation. Today, um, again, it's, it's deeply disappointing, but it's not surprising that the Tories are not supportive of the general principles. And unfortunately, I think some of the members are continuing to make the mistake of confusing the issues of quota with merit. And you know, really perpetuating the myth. I think, um, you know, Alison Harris, we got on very well outside the chamber, but I feel that Alison Harris is saying that positive action is, is somehow special treatment. It's not about promoting on merit. And I think that argument fails to acknowledge and recognise that we're not talking about a level playing field. Um, so I, I think the, 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 um, the, the arguments that have been made against positive action are, are deeply flawed. Um, I think a number of speakers, um, including Gail Ross, I think Gail Ross made an excellent contribution where she declared quite proudly that, that she uh, had been selected by her party um, as a result of positive um, action. I think there's quite a few of us who would say the same, including myself. Um, I was first of all elected as a, as a council candidate in 2012 on an all-women shortlist where the party was putting forward two candidates and at least one would be a woman as a result of that process and to become a, member, a, a, a candidate for the Scottish Parliament, myself and Al Elaine Smith were, were zipped on, on the list for Central Scotland and that meant that in terms of our group there are two men and there are two women uh, who came to the Parliament last May and, and I would defend that all of us are there on merit. So I don't really understand the concerns that, um, that the Conservative front bench has, because although we might all have different opinions on, on policy and ideology, um, I think there's a, a healthy respect here amongst members. And, and I would, um, um, I don't think she needs me to defend her corner, but I would wholeheartedly agree that, that Gail Ross is here on merit and good luck to anyone who wants to, to take her on. Um, <laughs> So I, mean, I, I don't know if at any time Annie Wells and Alison Harris and Rachel Hamilton will, will change their minds, um, but they seem to be wrestling with, with some of the, the arguments. So I, I remain optimistic that maybe by the end of this session, the Conservatives will take another look at this. Um, I think another point worth making to, um, to the Tory front bench is that you know, your, your party really does lag behind on gender equality, and we can see that when, when your benches are full. So perhaps there are things that the parties can learn from each other, particularly from the Scottish Labour Party and the SNP when it comes to selecting candidates. Um, on the, the need for positive action, um, I know that Tala Yacoub has been quoted already, but she's one of my uh, heroes. So uh, she's the chair of the Women 50-50 campaign and an amazing campaigner on women's rights. And Tala Yacoub puts the case forward so well. Um, she says there is not an equal footing in politics for men and women. The status quo favours men. If you really want to do something about equality, saying the right words and reassuring yourself that you really care isn't enough. Change doesn't come from warm words, it comes from progressive action. 
quotas are the only truly progressive action. And other members have pointed to evidence from right across the world that it is the only thing that works. Um, I think I've got six minutes yet, so I'll just finish up, um, presiding officer. The purpose of the bill is very clear. It's to increase the representation of women on public boards and to ensure that our decision-making processes are truly representative of the society it seeks to represent. I think there's very little to argue with. I welcome the clarification from the Cabinet Secretary on a number of points. And I think that with the um, very capable scrutiny on the committee, we will see uh, issues being smoothed out and amendments coming forward that hopefully means that we can all um, support this bill. I call Jamie Green. Eight minutes, please, Mr Green. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The importance of gender equality in our society is something that's been greatly emphasised today, I think, by all members. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary opened the debate by saying that she hopes that these benches will support this equality legislation. I should, should start by saying that whilst we don't support the mechanics of this legislation, there is no doubt, certainly in my view, that we do support equality. And we all support her on that. I recently joined the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, and this is one of the first substantive pieces of legislation that we have addressed. And I have taken an active role in the evidence sessions, listening earnestly to the witnesses, quizzing them, taking notes, and it's been a learning curve uh, for me, for sure. And despite our political differences, the debate has today mo been mostly respectful, with people making arguments with much conviction and belief. Uh, and whilst we ultimately dissented from the stage one report, I'm appreciative of the fact that other members in the committee valued our opinions and our views and helped shaping the report. Indeed, some of these constructive suggestions seem to have been taken on board uh, by the... <coughs> by the I'd like to make some progress, if you don't mind. Um, and some of these suggestions have been take taken on board by the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we do support the end goal of more diversity, but we do not support the methods in this particular bill. Uh, the first main issue with the bill, I think, as has been discussed greatly, is its focus on a target, which is not surprising in that the bill seeks to introduce uh, a 50% quota. And I understand that there's apathy to label it a quota, uh, because it is a, a polarizing term uh, in this debate. Um, but issuing a mandatory target, target of 50% is a quota by any other means. Uh, and I don't think this looks at the underlying issues which uh, uh, face um, women. In our view, gender equality is not and should not be a numbers game. Uh, this mandatory quota does not address the underlying issues that working uh, women face. The focus has become the target and the number, not the person or the quality of the candidate. Now, gender parity in all aspects of life is a good thing. Uh, I will take a, an adventure from Monica Lennon. Monica Lennon. Thank you. I'm just a little bit intrigued because when you think about the composition of boards or local authorities or indeed the parliament and you look at the proportion of, of men to women, is it the view of the Conservative Party that everyone in position is their own merit? Jamie Green. I'd very much like to think that everyone in this chamber of all parties is here on merit. We all got here in different avenues, uh, absolutely. But uh, we, as a matter of principle, don't think that mandatory quotas are the way forward to make progress in this. Um, in fact, my colleague Al Alison Harris pointed out that uh, many organisations, both uh, public and private, in including the third sector, are making uh, active progress towards parity uh, by changing uh, their organisational culture to uh, improve gender equality. We should be encouraging this sort of behaviour. Uh, I thought, I felt like, I'd like to make some progress, I felt that like Alison's speech was very heartfelt and despite some of the heckling uh, she received, uh, it, it was an honest view from a female politician in, in my eyes. She reiterated the point that if the direction of travel is organically improving, then is this bill a legislation for legislation's sake? Moreover, if it lacks effective enforcement. Now I hear the argument that the bill is required to stop future regression in government, but perhaps I have more faith that organisational and behavioural shifts are far more positive than quotas. Indeed, 50, setting a 50% target may, some may argue, divert attention away from true progress, as once the quota has been reached, the job is perceived to be done. And this goes no way to address the underlying lack of applicants from a diverse pool of talent. I do have got a lot to get through, if you don't mind. I'd like to turn to some of the contributions that were made today. Um, I will give way if, if, if Mr Harvey insists. Patrick Harvey. I'm, I'm very grateful to the, to the member for giving way. Uh, he makes an argument that not only are quotas and targets unnecessary, but that they could be harmful. I assume he has some evidence to demonstrate the harm that takes place 
when quotas and targets are used. Because those following this debate, including the Women 50-50 campaign, are making clearly the point, they say there is, an over, there is overwhelming evidence that states that quotas promote merit and actually increase the level of merit overall. Quotas and targets are successful. I can allow you the time, Mr Green. Jamie Green. Thank, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I, I guess what I'm saying is I'm, I'm raising the point, is there a risk? that by having a fifth cent target, if a, a board achieves that target, they take their foot off the pedal. And we're diverting attention away from greater diversity, a greater wide range of protected characteristics and boards, which I think is where we should be heading. I'd like to touch on some of the other contributions made. I actually would like to point towards Mary Fee's contribution on the inclusion of transgender women. I think it was very encouraging that the Cabinet Secretary acknowledged that that was lacking uh, in the initial stages of the bill, and that the government is approaching this bill with an open mind in that respect. Um, Patrick Harvey did mention the, the point around how non-binary people are represented too. Um, my colleague Rachel Hamilton discussed her worries around the somewhat one-dimensional definition of diversity. And this is something that's come up frequently, as, as many stakeholders have pointed out. The Stage 1 report says that boards should reflect Scotland's rich tapestry of life. But our rich tapestry is not just about men and women, it's also about LGBTI people, BME people, disabled people, and in my view, focusing on one protected characteristic over another does not promote true diversity. Moreover, as, I, as the bill stands at the moment, I do not believe it will be effective in uh, promoting gender equality simply by forcing recruiters or ministers to choose one gender over another. Um, we've also pointed out that the current bill is incredibly, incredibly ambiguous and effectively non-enforceable, which is a valid criticism of the legislation, regardless of whether you agree with the principles of causes or not. I do recognise the bills at stage one, and there is room for improvement. But at the bill... At pr uh, I, I shall. Alex Cole-Hamilton. Well, to Jamie, for, uh, Jamie Green for taking uh, my intervention. I'm just baffled that he and Annie Wells are standing in opposition to this. In the foothills of our consideration of it, they grappled with it enthusiastically, only to return from a group meeting ashen-faced to say that they would be opposing. If you're opposing this under duress, Mr Green, please say just so. blink, blink twice yeah. for yes. <laughs> Jamie Green. Confirmed, Mr. Cohamden, I'm under absolutely no duress today uh, whatsoever. And the reason for that is because Annie Wells and I had a very long discussion about this, and she has been consistently, she has been consistently of the view that she opposes uh, uh, quotas. And I also spoke to my other female colleagues, including Rachel Hamilton, Alison Harris, and Ruth Davidson, for their views on it, and I respect their views. Um, I, I think I would like to raise a, a briefly a point uh, that I was a little bit troubled by the response to my intervention, perhaps the Cabinet Secretary could address it further in summing up, whereby the situation when if a board is faced with two candidates, uh, one man and one woman, the preference is given to women unless the appointing com person can prove uh, why they did otherwise. In the bill as it stands, there is much ambiguity. Words like best qualified, equally qualified, and the particular phrase justified on the basis of a characteristic situation particular to that candidate. And I don't think it, it goes in any way strong enough to give pr adequate guidance in the law itself. Uh, and I don't believe that secondary guidance is enough uh, to give any comfort to boards that they're making the right decisions. Uh, we also pointed out the lack of post-legislative scrutiny. Uh, Rachel Hamilton mentioned that. And also the experience uh, uh, um, of other countries um, who have introduced these codes. I think it would be worth um, putting some merit in analysing the effect that has had on boards and women's ability to move within companies uh, as a result of those quotas. Um, Alexander pointed out that nowhere in this bill do we address other issues such as uh, lack of child uh, or elderly care, inflexible working hours or indeed uh, workplace harassment that discourage women from applying to these positions. This bill does not address any of those issues. Um, I would finally like to uh, point out the, I think, excellent contribution that Monica Lennon made today, and also in particular the way that she's conducted the debate on behalf of her party. We may disagree on the outcome, but I am very thankful for the, the, the input from Labour today. Uh, equally, Elaine Smith's uh, input on the fact that this bill lacks uh, a lot of teeth in many ways. Um, I think in closing, um, I do hear the evidence uh, from both sides of this argument, and I really hope the uh, Chamber trusts that I approach this subject with a very open mind. But I am minded to listen to the somewhat persuasive views of my female colleagues and their genuine belief that this bill is not the best way to achieve the outcome. Thank you. May I ask the Cabinet Secretary um, to close this debate? If you could take us up to quarter to five, please, Ms Constance. Uh, thank you, President Officer. 
Could I start by saying that perhaps Mr Green would be a wee bit less in the dark if he was at committee the day that I gave evidence or indeed uh, you know, had accepted my very uh, generous invitation from a, a, a busy woman to come and meet with me to discuss uh, the bill further. Uh, I know that we've still not managed to, to arrange that uh, date in the diary. Presiding officer, we, we have had a, a free and frank uh, exchange of views. It has indeed been a debate uh, in the uh, fullest meaning uh, of that word, and there's been lots of uh, interventions, which has been great to see. And we've had a wee bit of a, a tour down history lane um, from Tom Arthur and indeed to a lesser extent from Alison Harris. And I suppose, um, thinking of history, I, I did recall uh, the Duchess of Athol. And I was quite surprised that none of our Conservative me me members uh, mentioned the Duchess of Athol at all, because the Duchess of Athol was the first woman MP in Scotland, and she was indeed a Conservative elected in the general election 1923 to serve Ken Ross and West Persia, I believe. And I also believe that it was David Lloyd George, the Liberal Prime Minister, that encouraged her uh, to stand. However, King George V tried to discourage her from standing because, well, her domestic duties, you know, were for her uh, to meet first and foremost. However, her husband was quite sympathetic. But the really interesting thing about the Duchess of Athol was the Duchess of Athol was, um, I suppose, an unlikely candidate to be Scotland's first woman Member of Parliament because actually she was opposed to women's suffrage. And I was reminded today by li listening to uh, some of our Conservative colleagues that at the end of the day, she had decided to put herself forward uh, to stand for Parliament because she thought it would help Conservative men to become accustomed to women in politics. Now, members will, of course, come to their own conclusions uh, whether the Duchess of Athol uh, succeeded uh, in her quest and her objective. And there is something about uh, listening to our Conservative colleagues today that is perhaps a little bit quaint, perhaps a little bit old-fashioned around the edges, but is certainly uh, on the wrong side of progress. Because there is absolutely uh, nothing uh, in this bill today that prevents action on uh, advancing women's uh, equality in the broadest sense, whether it's the youth employment strategy, development of Scotland's young workforce, something which I am very proud of, I'm very uh, attached uh, to that work that I led, whether it's the work on the STEM strategy, whether it's the massive expansion of early learning and childcare, or whether it's the work that we are doing uh, to encourage uh, employers the length and breadth of Scotland to uh, adopt uh, family flexible working. Because we accept there is nothing can be taken in isolation. One bill alone uh, won't solve uh, the, the issues uh, and all the complexity and in all the enormity around women's equality. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't act and that we shouldn't take this bill forward. Because my fear is, uh, in a moment, Mr Rumbles, my fear is that the Conservatives are in real danger of missing the moment. Of missing a moment when we have all been reminded by recent events where the lid has been well and truly lifted that this country of ours is nowhere near as equal as it should be, or indeed as perhaps some of us uh, thought uh, it was in 2017. And I would make a plea uh, across the chamber that collectively, let's not miss that moment. And I'll give back Mr Rumbles. Mike Rumbles. For giving way, does he not agree with me that the Conservatives seem to me, anyway, to be using something of a smokescreen here about this constant use of the word quotas? Quotas means that people cannot apply for a job. They cannot apply. There's no way, could the Minister confirm that there's nowhere in this bill so that people cannot or are excluded from applying for, for posts, that this is not about quotas, it's about reaching an objective. Uh, yes, President Officer, I agree this is about uh, the bill sets a gender representative objection uh, that is indeed positive action, but it's positive action uh, based on merit. And what Mr Rumbles and I think other members uh, have touched upon is that the Conservatives today, as well as being in danger of missing the moment, they are in danger uh, of missing the point because it was Alec Cole Hamilton who articulated the conclusions that the committee reached when he said that positive action and appointing on merit are not mutually exclusive. And actually, we're not allowed not to appoint on merit because that would be uh, against the law. And in fact, the committee went further and it went as far as saying that we welcome the decision to legislate in this area 
and appreciate the efforts made to ensure that the Bill encourages positive action and appointment on merit rather than encroaching into positive discrimination. And Gail Ross was absolutely right when she said that this bill was about widening the net. It was about tapping in to all the talents, about finding better ways to tap into the talents of 51.5% of the population. And she's right to say that that will indeed increase uh, competition. It will increase competition amongst women, but it will certainly uh, increase uh, competition uh, for the men. And if I can say to Jamie Green, Annie Wells, Alison Harris and indeed uh, Rachel Harris that actions underpin the aspirations uh, of this bill, Rachel Hamilton I mean, and actions and it's actions from uh, the ground up because as well as a gender representative uh, objective there is a duty to encourage applications and to take actions to make sure that we're reaching in to that talent pool of suitably qualified uh, women and other individuals. There is a duty uh, to report and indeed we're taking on board uh, the very fair observations uh, from committee and other stakeholders about how we could enhance uh, those duties uh, to report. And this isn't just about the end result. What this bill is encapsulating is how we actually get there and how we are there once we get there, how we actually sustain that progress and don't inadvertently <coughs> uh, turn the clock back. And just for the record, presiding officer, I don't know any woman in this chamber who isn't here on merit. We will all have different routes, different journeys at different times uh, in history, but I don't know anybody in this chamber who is not here on merit. And we shouldn't try and imply there is uh, either directly or indirectly. And no one has answered the question that when we've had talks about cultural change, about voluntary measures, no one can point to what we are not doing already. What else should we be doing? No one on the opposition benches has answered that today. Uh, yes, briefly. Rachel Hamilton. We talked about the Scotland's youth employment strategy, and uh, recently um, there was a, a survey done within uh, my constituency and a primary school uh, with the uh, developing young workforce. And they asked the P1s what they'd like to be when they grow up, and they said fairies and dinosaurs. By the time they got to P7, the boys wanted to be firemen and the girls wanted to be nurses. What is the um, initiative that the Cabinet Secretary would bring in to change the culture from a very young age and actually educate uh, young people to change their attitudes towards becoming and, and uh, attaining gender imbalance? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, it was only two days ago that I stood here in this very chamber and spoke about the importance of tackling gender stereotypes and indeed made an announcement uh, about the funding that we as a Scottish Government are putting into a whole school's approach to tackle the gender stereotyping around gender-based violence. I'm not going to take any lectures from anybody over there about the importance of tackling gender stereotyping, but what they fail to understand is that tackling gender stereotyping is not an excuse not to support this bill and the Equalities and Human Rights Committee also said that they were heartened to learn of the number of initiatives and the level of support by the Scottish Government's public appointments team and indeed the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life uh, to public bodies in terms of seeking to make uh, our boards more representative of society as a whole. And I make no apologies for introducing a bill to this Parliament that is indeed firmly focused on gender, given that we have a, a, a programme for government, a manifesto commitment to do so, and indeed that women are not a minority, they are 51.5% of the population. But as we've tried to repeatedly explain throughout this process, in terms of addressing the gender imbalance uh, that exists in public sector boards, there are indeed wider <coughs> benefits for other people in other communities. And we see that through the work that's been undertaken in the Public Appointments Improvement Programme, 
the new equality outcome that is about tackling the under-representation of disabled people and young people on public sector boards. Now, I have been more than generous uh, with my time. The outreach activity uh, to reach into the uh, disability community and the black and minority ethnic community to encourage more applications into the public sector appointments. And of course, we have got the disability delivery plan uh, and indeed uh, the race equality uh, framework. So there is absolutely nothing in this bill that prevents further work to ensure that we improve and address the underrepresentation uh, of disabled people, uh, young people or ethnic minority people uh, on our boards. And I'm reminded of the quote by Ban Ki-moon, who always very eloquently and succinctly says that equality for women uh, is indeed uh, progress for all. Presiding officer, I am grateful to all members for their contributions and indeed for their scrutiny this afternoon. I very much hope uh, that Parliament will back the general principles of the Gender Representation uh, Public <coughs> Board Scotland Bill. This bill is an example uh, of this Parliament using our new powers to take very decisive action to redress an imbalance which is underrepresentation of women, despite women being the majority uh, and not the minority of the population on public sector boards. And what we want to do is to lock in the gains that we have made uh, thus far and maintaining and building on the momentum and future proofing what we want to achieve in Scotland and future uh, proofing the progress we've made because we do not want to be taking backward steps that surely just cannot be an option and the evidence uh, presiding officer is clear that addressing the underrepresentation of women in public boards is not just the right thing to do it's actually the smart thing to do leading to better decisions and leading to better performance of public sector boards. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That concludes our stage one debate on the gender representation on public boards Scotland Bill. And if members are so inclined, I'm minded to take a motion without notice to bring forward decision time to now. I will invite the Minister to move such a motion. Happy to move. Thank you very much. The question is that we move decision time to now. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And there's one question at decision time. The question is that motion 9257, in the name of Angela Constance, on stage one of the gender representation on public boards Scotland bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll have a division when members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 9257 in the name of Angela Constance is yes 71, no 28. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting.